Welcome to What is Going Om for new thought from the edge of Om. Each week on Om Times flagship radio show, veteran broadcaster, author, and media consultant Sandy Sedgbeer conducts thought provoking interviews with inspirational authors, artists, musicians, scientists, speakers, and filmmakers who are working at the point where spirituality and science meet consciousness at the very edge of Om. Here is your host, Sandy Sedgbeer. Hello. In 2022, the global personal development market was estimated to be worth over $43 billion, and it's estimated to grow substantially over the next six years. We humans, it would seem, aren't content with sitting on our laurels. For many of us, who we are is not enough. We yearn to grow, expand, and evolve into something better. Whether it's to improve our physical and mental health, uplevel our social skills, or develop more self-awareness, our lives become a perpetual quest for self-improvement. And judging by those statistics, we're prepared to invest substantial sums of money in the process. But what if there were an easier and more affordable way to change our attitude transform our behavior, improve our decision-making, and create better lives and relationships for ourselves. Eric Weiner is author of the New York Times bestsellers, The Geography of Bliss, One Grump's Search for the Happiest Places in the World, and The Geography of Genius, as well as the critically acclaimed Man Seeks God and the Socrates Express. A former international correspondent for NPR, his work has appeared in the Atlantic, National Geographic, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, and many other great publications. In his latest book, Ben and Me, In Search of a Founder's Formula for a Long and Useful Life, he follows in the footsteps of founder, statesman, scientist, inventor, diplomat, publisher, and philosopher, Benjamin Franklin mining his life for inspiring and practical ideas and lessons for living and thinking well. Eric Weiner, welcome. Thank you, Sandy. It's great to see you again, and I always enjoy our conversations. Me too. You argue that we have uh, a great deal to learn from the past and that we'd all be better off if we acted and thought a bit more like Ben Franklin did. Why did you choose... Franklin as a model for self-improvement? It's a, it's a good question. Um, I, I admit that he represents a bit of a departure for me in that normally my books focus on uh, wisdom that speaks uh, a foreign tongue. Uh, Mahatma Gandhi, Confucius, Nietzsche. And it, it dawned on me that I've sort of been avoiding my own country in a way. <laughs> and our, my own, uh, the founders of the U.S. Um, and most people know Benjamin Franklin because his face is on the $100 bill. And, you know, I was uh, in a carpet shop in Kabul, Afghanistan, a number of years ago, covering the war there and uh, taking a break and dipping into a carpet shop. And I'm like, well, I'm going to buy this carpet. And took out a bunch of 10s and 20s, uh, US dollars was what the, the merchant wanted. And he said, no, 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 only Franklin's, only Franklin's, only the $100 bill. And uh, he is much more than that, though. He's much more than this. He's sort of become the face of unbridled capitalism. But I found out that he's, he's a lot more than that. He had uh, socialist tendencies. He also had capitalist tendencies. Um, he just also aged very well. Um, unlike you, Sandy, I am getting older every day. And um, I was approaching a major uh, birthday where the number six features prominently, I won't name it. And, uh, and I thought back to the time in the carpet shop, I thought about Franklin and I thought, wow, you know, I read a bit about him and discovered that he, the last third of his life was by far the most interesting and the first two thirds were absolutely fascinating. But it was in the last third from, well, the age of 57 to 84, he lived until 84, it was that period where he did the most, changed the most. Um, he, he lived in London for a number of years in Paris. He was a very much a globalist, um, but he never stopped learning. He never stopped doing. 
but he never stopped changing his mind well into his 80s. And I thought, wow, that strikes me as a, you know, a pretty good model for, for aging. Because we, we don't have models for aging. We have, you know, models of older people clinging desperately and rather pathetically to their youth. But we don't have models for people who actually say, you know, I'm, I'm going to, I am older, but there are things I can do and there are things I can do better than younger people. He's a model for so much, isn't he? I mean, he's reading your book. You know, we Brits don't know Franklin. Um, you know, we're even less than most Americans. You know, he's just a name that we've heard of. We don't know much about him. He right. doesn't feature in any of our school history lessons at all. Yeah, um, I want to jump in here for a second and say, yet the only one of his four remaining houses, uh, four houses that still stands. I know. Uh, is in in london um just in the shadow of charing cross station so there you yeah go. well it was a you know the book is a great history lesson for me it's also a very funny one um which is something that i always enjoy um but um he you know what i'm uh, curious about is why do you find the past so appealing that's a good question um I think because the same reason that I find travel so appealing, to be honest, you know, there was a, a British writer whose name escape, escapes me who said that uh, the past is a foreign country. They do things differently there. Mm. And I love that quote. And it's it's true. Um, so you can uh, to experience that otherness. And that's what interests me is otherness, broadening the realm of possibility. And one way to do that is through travel, um, traveling to places like Bhutan and Iceland where they do things differently. Um, but another way to experience otherness uh, is to go back in time uh, into the past. And, you know, we, we have this attitude, this, this negative attitude toward the past. First of all, we Americans are terrible about history. You know, if something's 10 years old, it's, it's history, you know, well, in London, you've got, you know, streets that are 150 years old and, and houses 150 years old, and that's nothing, right? But first of all, as an American, we're, we're terrible at history, and we tend to view it as, uh, and I think this is universally true, as something negative. Um, those who don't learn from the past are doomed to repeat it. Yes. Why doomed? Why, why so negative? Um, uh, how about... Um, going back into the past and yes cherry picking like don't don't take the the bad stuff into the present but there are lessons we can learn whether it's from ancient greece or 18th century philadelphia or london that are still valid today and i would say that those who don't learn the, le the good lessons from the past are doomed not to repeat them not to learn from them and it gets tricky because, um, let's take the 18th century, the period I'm writing about here as an example, there were lots of bad things then. Um, there were diseases that we now have cures for. Um, there was racism and, and slavery and misogyny and all those things. Um, but there were also ways of being in the world, ways of conversing, like in coffee houses in London, for instance, they called them penny universities because for the price of one cup of coffee, one penny, you could learn an awful lot. Um, and there were approaches to life, a sort of polymath approach where you could be a, a little bit of everything. There were ways of thinking and being, you know, being spiritual and being religious that we have, have lost today. So what I'm trying to do is resurrect the good things from the past and discard the bad ones. And I think that's that's perfectly good. I think that we should not import the past wholesale any more than we would want to import like lessons um i keep mentioning england because of franklin's time there and your accent but I'll, I'll keep mentioning it we we you know there are things that we americans can learn from their brits but there are things we should not import from you guys too you know that we do better so yeah. so anyway so that is my my approach to the history is not as a as a traditional historian um i'm not trying to write the official record of the 18th century or the official biography of Benjamin Franklin. Those exist. They're a thousand pages long. What I'm trying to do is, and, and, and I'll sum this up here, is encounter the past and encounter the Franklin in a personal way. That's why the book is called Ben and Me. I'm the me. 
Franklin is the man. Yeah. And we stand in for you as well, because, you know, while we're reading all of these little things, all these wonderful little things that don't appear in the biographies, um, we're learning so much about him. Right. And hopefully as a, a person and the, the problem with historical figures is we we either uh, cancel them, which is something that happens today, or we put them up on a pedestal and they're up on the pedestal. They're, they're gray. Their statues are gray. You've got them all over London. Right. These gray statues, they're lifeless and you don't feel like you really know them. And I wanted the reader through me to know Franklin flaws and all because he was absolutely no saint to know Franklin as a human being, to picture sitting down and having a beer or a glass of Madeira, his favorite wine with him. But do we really know the man himself? You know, he seems, he's got so many interests, so many talents. I mean, inventor, I love the word possibilian. I'm gonna adopt that one because, you know, he he's very inspirational in that regard in that he's not the kind of man, you know, who would um, turn things away that just because he doesn't know much about them. Um, but, you know, the person, I mean, he lived behind so many different masks. And in fact, the whole book, you know, you've put all of these adjectives to describe oh. Ben at certain stages and times in his life. You know, I, I don't know whether we truly do know the man. We don't. Um, and that is partly on purpose because of Franklin. He didn't want to be known. He, he, he uh, enjoyed hiding behind these masks, these pseudonyms. He wrote in dozens and dozens of pseudonyms. He wrote, he wrote as a, 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 at age 16, he wrote as a, as a middle-aged widow from Boston, um, <laughs> had these essays published in his brother's newspaper and fooled everyone to the point where readers were writing in and proposing marriage to this woman named Silence Do Good. Um, he wrote as the King of Prussia, as an Algerian emir, uh, as a uh, single mother of many children. And he was, he showed great empathy that way and that he was able to give voice to these people and to, to I wouldn't say hi, but not hi, to sort of play these different roles. And we all do that, you know, right now you're talking to me and you've got your your interviewer mask on. And I'm sure when you deal with friends and family or colleagues, you put on a slightly different mask. Um, it doesn't make you phony. Um, you know, the, the 1960s guru and philosopher Alan Watts had this wonderful term about how you should be a genuine fake. And, and I, I love that. And I think it describes Benjamin Franklin to a T. Um, yes. And it doesn't mean that you're a phony. What does it mean to be a genuine fake? It means that life is a play, as Shakespeare said, right? We're all actors, players on the stage. And um, and so play it fully. You know, if you're going to be Sandy the interviewer, play that role fully. Um, and as, as a father, I play that role. I'm, I'm a fake father, but I'm a genuine fake and a fake husband. And so it's sort of just embracing that idea that, you know, that we're not solid. You know, every seven to 10 years, the, the majority of the molecules in our body um, will change, right? So that we're every 10 years, not completely, but largely we, we become different people. Um, and are you the same person you were when you were 20? Uh, you're not. And the Buddhists, of course, have this notion of no self, that there is uh, no genuine self because there's simply no self. You know, mm. we're getting more physical, but this is on radio, so we can do that. Um, but so it's 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 a different approach to authenticity, and I think Franklin had that. He he wasn't trying to be authentic, Ben Franklin. He was trying on different roles. He lived in a time when it was much easier to be inventor, diplomat, postmaster. All these things that I list. In the book, it was much easier. Now people want to know that from age 18, if not earlier, what are you going to do with your life? What role are you going to play? Franklin never subscribed to that. He would refuse to be put into a box. He was an incredibly um, funny man. Um, you know, he was very inventive, had a great imagination. I mean, some of those pseudonyms, you know, they're straight out of 
Dickens, and I makes me wonder whether Dickens was inspired, you know, by some of the names that um, Franklin had come up with for his mm. masks. I mean, um, Silence yeah. Do Good, Alice Adams. Afterward, <laughs> yeah, and um, and some of them were obviously, you know, meant to uh, be transparently fake, you know. Others he would, you know, try to uh, imbibe them and, and pull it off. And, and you know, um, when he wrote as the, the king, king of Prussia, this was, he was living in London and there was the, the tensions between um, the British and the American colonies were really heating up. And he wrote this piece saying the king of Prussia wanted to take England back, you know, and he, and Franklin wrote under a pseudonym and he's at a, a fancy dinner party somewhere in London and, and people have just read it in the newspaper and they're like, they're, they're just talking about how this is terrible. The King of Prussia is going to, they're going to invade us. And Franklin just was smiling, you know, because he, he, he knew it was his words. And um, so he, he was very mischievous that way too. He loved to play pranks like that too. Yeah. He certainly is. Um, was I say he is yeah, he's still alive, and he's still alive for me. It was great to use the, the present tense because that's when I wrote the book. I thought of it him as an is, not a was. Um, yeah. And I think that's one way we can bring these past these historical figures alive is to speak of them in the present tense. Yeah. So, so not not a, a slip of the tongue at all. So, what gave you the idea to you know have your chapter titles? With those adjectives about the different masks that you know okay. all the different facets of his character yeah, like naked ben and angry ben yeah, yeah we're going to talk about naked ben in the right. minute so this will give just an insight into my writing process is um when i'm working on a book i need a model chapter like once i have that one chapter then i know i've got the tone and i've got the the feel for the the book and Often, in fact, always that that chapter is, is not the first chapter. You think it would be, but it's not. It's often somewhere in the middle. And in this case, it was the Buddha Ben chapter. Um, I oh, latched on to the term Buddha Ben um, because I I discovered a uh, a Buddha Ben uh, on eBay, where all great discoveries are made. Uh, this is Franklin uh, in the seated lotus position uh, in meditation, but it's Franklin as as a Buddha like figure. And then I started to think, oh, he really did display these kind of bodhisattva tendencies. Of bodhisattva is someone uh, who's enlightened, but instead of going onto nirvana, stays back and, and helps the rest of us achieve enlightenment. And I start to see these similarities, and I, I write about that in that chapter. And I, I call that I realize that chapter should be called Buddha Ben. And then I start to look and say, wait, there is naked Ben, and there's angry Ben. Um, and there's funny Ben and um, yeah. and many other Bens, and since, Ben, yeah, empirical uh, Ben. <laughs> what's that? Empirical Ben, yes. And so, um, and curious Ben, and so it was a way of getting at him and writing about him, not in a strictly chronological way, which is you know how most biographies are arranged this year to this year and. And I do follow somewhat chronologically, but I focus on a theme for each chapter and a different aspect of him. But the idea is to, to universalize him. Um, you know, we can't be Ben Franklin. That's not the point of the book. It's not, the book's not called Being Ben. It's Ben and Me. But we can learn about, um, about how to just use angry, anger as, a, as an example. We can learn about how to channel our anger into more productive means um everything he wrestled with are things we wrestle with today yeah. and those those are universal those don't change the technology changes but um the, those human or, or demons let's put it that way don't never change you really like to get under the skin of your subjects you know i mean when you go you know you go to the places where they lived where they walked you like to be able to see the sights and talking of skin, you did some air bathing yourself to see what Franklin might have gained from it. Tell us about his love of air bathing and your experience of it. Okay, so Franklin, let's, let's I'm going to set the time and place for you. It's uh, roughly 1760. We're in London. 
Um, we're on Craven Street, a small street, um, a pretty historic one, um, right in the shadow of Charing Cross, which was a, a carriage station. This is before the time of trains, of course, but but it was still a carriage station then. And uh, it's a bustling place, and Franklin is, is living at number seven Craven Street. And he uh, believed in the benefits of fresh air. Now, this was a time when many people did not, and they would always sleep with the windows closed because they thought fresh air was was dangerous. You know, you wanted, you didn't want that fresh air coming in. They thought that that's how you got a cold or you got sick was from too much fresh air. Franklin didn't think so. He slept with one window open. And then every morning he'd wake up and he slept in these pajamas and he would strip off all his clothes, open more windows, stand in front of them and pace around and just sort of let it all hang out first thing in the morning. And he found it extremely therapeutic. Uh, he called it air bathing, which sounds, I think, more noble than <laughs> no age man walking around naked. Um, I suspect the neighbors found it less therapeutic than he did, I should say. Um, Better the name and, than flashing. <laughs> yeah, so, and he, he found this very therapeutic and he told some physician friends about it and they wrote about it, it's how we know about it. And he, um, he would then sometimes go back to sleep and said he would sleep this beautiful, restful sleep after air bathing. And, um, and it's a wonderful term. He did it for the rest of his life. Um, most mornings. And I, because I wanted this book to be interactive as much as possible. So that I was trying on his, some of his ideas. I wasn't, you know, trying to be Ben Franklin, but I was like, let me see if, if this works. So one morning I got up, I'm back home now in, in my suburban Washington, D.C. home and, and um, no one else is home. It was just me and my dog at the time. And um, and I had no Zoom calls that day, which was good. Um, so I decided I, I'd strip naked. You know, I sit down at my computer and I start to just kind of write. And the writing came very easily. And um, at first I felt a little absurd sitting there naked writing. But um, it's nice. I don't do it every day, but I do it occasionally. And um, air bathing definitely sounds <laughs> better than the alternatives. He was very good at naming things that way. Very good at naming things. He, was, yeah. he was, had a marketing mind as well. He he knew that words matter and that what we call things matter. And um, that's why he would do very well in our modern world. I think he's the one historic figure from America's past, maybe from the whole 18th century, that you can picture plopped into, say, a cafe in San Francisco with noise canceling headphones on and his MacBook Air Pro uh, typing away. And in fact, many people in Silicon Valley, including Elon Musk, um, are fans of Franklin. Elon Musk has gone on the record saying that Franklin is his, his hero and his role model. And we can talk about that because I don't think Franklin would necessarily consider Elon Musk his role model. Yeah. Do you think that if he was alive today, he would be an ad man? An ad man? Yeah. Like advertising? He's so good with words. No, no. I think he was more than that. I think that's selling him short. He was good with words, but he had meaning behind them. Um, we haven't really gotten to, I think, one of the main themes of the book, and it's in the subtitle, was usefulness. See, I don't think advertising is all that useful. Um, I think he, he really, and I think this is what separates him from the tech bros, if I can call them that, of Silicon Valley, like Elon Musk, is he wasn't just interested in something that was new. He was always interested in how can this be useful. So he, in, in his uh, late 30s, early 40s, retires from the printing business. He's made a, a, a chunk of money, and he's interested in electricity. And at first, it's just curiosity. Um, it was this new, wide open field. Um, but quickly, he's thinking, how can this be useful? Well, one thing he did was he electrocuted turkeys um, and said they tasted better if they were electrocuted. Um, so uh, lots of nervous turkeys around Market Street in Philadelphia. And, um, and he thought of the, the lightning rod. This is his greatest invention, probably, is the lightning rod. Um, and it is useful. 
Um, and the post office that he ran was useful. And almost everything he invented a flexible catheter, he invented a long arm that you can use to reach books on your top shelf. Um, one thing he invented that the usefulness is, is a little trickier to define is this instrument called the glass harmonica, not harmonica, harmonica, A-R-M, uh, from the Italian word for harmony. And it is, um, boy, they still exist today. It's quite remarkable. If you've ever put your finger around the rim of a glass of wine or water and it makes a sound and with different amounts of water and at different pitches, that's the, the, the concept behind it. But he took it to a whole new level and came up with the this spindle that would turn around and and it had bowls or glasses on it and you would rub your fingers on it and uh, i've tried playing one it's very difficult um but when played properly it sounds ethereal um for such a rational man this is an extremely irrational <laughs> instrument um if you've seen the harry potter movies the glass harmonica features in them and it's mm -hmm. um, one of the creatures in there um and also the movie gravity it's the first sound you hear is from the glass harmonica so that was that's kind of a usefulness of the heart i think that instrument it allows you to express some very deep feelings um but no i don't if he came back today i think he'd probably be a social entrepreneur of some kind um more than a silicon valley tech bro um i think he and this is this is i think one lesson we can learn from him is we we're so enamored of the latest app or the latest gadget to come out of silicon valley but do we really look at the the usefulness of it you know is it does it solve a problem or does it is it solving a problem is it a solution in search of a problem you know and often that's the case and and none of franklin's inventions or his ideas were, were frivolous like some of these are you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, you look at some of the things we have today when they're invented, we think they're fantastic, like the first, you know, mobile phones, um, which didn't do much more than text and take calls. Now we see the dark side of that because we've got these, you know, devices in our hands that do everything and consume our lives. Everything that he invented was re really useful and it didn't seem to have a dark side. You know, when you think about some of the things that he started, um, some of the social things like, um, you know, firehouses and, um, you know, fire departments, libraries, um, libraries hospitals, insurance companies. Um, yeah. And um, yeah, I mean, the, the library is a good example. It's the first uh, circulating subscription library in the American colonies. And um, and he started that in in Philadelphia. And it's a way of, I, I say that what he did is he tricked people into being better versions of themselves. Um, he also invented the, the matching grant, and I think which, which is now a, a staple in the nonprofit world. And this is a good example. So he wanted to build uh, a hospital. There was no hospital in Pennsylvania. There was no hospital worthy of the name in the American colonies. Um, this is in the I think, early 1750s. And, and actually the, the idea for the hospital came from a friend of his, a physician. He said, we should start a hospital. The physician, Dr. Bond was good doctor, terrible at fundraising. So he goes to Benjamin Franklin and says, what do we do? And so um, Franklin adopts a pseudonym writes anonymously or under the pseudonym in, in the local newspaper, which he happens to own. And he says, you know, what we really need is a hospital. He's not attaching his name to it, just throwing this idea. Out. Wouldn't it be great? And we could train doctors and it would pay for itself in a number of years. So he gets the idea out into the air. And then he goes to the Pennsylvania Assembly and says, you know, you, know you don't have a lot of money, but pounds, they were using British pounds then. Um, if I can raise 2,000 pounds, will you match it with 2,000 pounds? And the head of the assembly, a man named Isaac Norris, says, sure, we'll sign that, because there's no way you'll raise 2,000 pounds, and we get to look generous without it costing a penny. And then he raised the money, and he had to pay up. And he, he took great pride in that. And that's what I mean by tricking people into being more generous than they might otherwise be. He, he wasn't beyond using um deception 
helpful deceit. He was against hurtful deceit, but he didn't say anything about helpful deceit. And he used that a lot. And I think, you know, it, it fits into this Buddhist notion, you know, of skillful means. The Buddhist idea of skillful means is the teacher can sometimes trip the student uh, in order to show them the way, the path. And this is Buddha Ben at work. Yeah. We're going to take a short break now, Eric. You're listening to What Is Going On. I'm Sandy Sedgbeer, and my guest today is former NPR foreign correspondent, writer, and New York Times bestselling author, Eric Weiner. And we're talking about his latest book, Ben and Me, In Search of a Founder's Formula for a Long and Useful Life. We'll be back with more from Eric Weiner after this break. Times TV. Hello, I'm Sandy Sedgbeer, host of Bottom Times flagship radio show, What Is Going On? And as an author, editor and 13 times book judge who's read thousands of books and interviewed hundreds of authors, I'm constantly asked what's really worth reading and what's not. So I created the No BS Spiritual Book Club to help you save time and money by picking the brains of discerning names who have walked this path before you. There's no catch, no fees and no BS. Just an ever-growing library of 10 best spiritual book lists from some of your favourite authors and teachers, plus free book excerpts, audios and video interviews with people like Don Miguel Ruiz Jr., David G., Lee Harris, Mark Nepo and more. From well-known classics to hidden gems you've never heard of, it's the only no BS guide to the best spiritual books to enlighten your journey of self-discovery. So why not join the club? Get inspired and save money at the no BS spiritual book club.com. Imagine becoming a super influencer, reinvent yourself, invest in your brand, and then manifest your success with a robust spheric approach. Own times media and broadcasting offers a unique and multifaceted way to become the spiritual and conscious influencer. You deserve to be by putting your message across our powerful platform with its proven record of integrity and excellence. Through our produced shows, Own Times offers the opportunity to become a social media TV personality, a radio show host, an Own Times magazine columnist, and a syndicated podcaster, all in one shot. By live streaming your show on Ohm Times TV and broadcasting it across the extensive Ohm Times radio and TV networks, you become more than a host. You become an ambassador and a force for positive change. Ohm Times, open yourself to the possibilities. Everything that we do, we can do in a contemplative manner. Through the art of contemplation, you can use the gene keys in a really powerful way. Gene Keys is basically the code book of life. In the Gene Keys, the book is made up of these three levels, shadows, gifts, and cities. And the journey is from, is through those three levels, kind of unpicking of the shadow states, the releasing of the gifts, and then the embodying of this higher consciousness called the city. And the cities are very exalted words. And it's not like we we kind of suddenly are all these exalted Christ-like beings but we have flashes and illuminations along the journey. And the more we get stuck into the journey, the more illumination comes to us because the more we're releasing the light from in these codes inside our DNA. So all those revelations are inside us. So the contemplative way is the inner way. There are 16 million children struggling with hunger in America. That's one in five daughters, sons, neighbors, and classmates who don't know where their next meal is coming from. Yet billions of pounds of good food go to waste every year. It's time we do something about it. Feeding America is a nationwide network of food banks that helps provide meals to millions of kids and families in need. Visit feedingamerica.org to help them feed even more. Together, we can solve hunger. Together, we're Feeding America. Welcome back. Eric Weiner, when Franklin was 20, he created a plan of 13 virtues to cultivate his character, which he continued to practice in some form for the rest of his life, you say, one of which was chastity. 
And yet rumours abound about Franklin's licentious nature. Yes, um, we, we love this image of lusty Ben, <laughs> um, I think. Um, that wasn't a chapter title, was it? <laughs> No, Lusty Ben. I don't think there was one, but I think it was uh, it was Randy Ben. Uh, I think it was understood. Um, let, let me just set the record straight. First of all, um, he was, just, I think, more open about his sexual life and um, his lasciviousness than, than other people were at the time. Um, and he definitely, you know, he fed these rumors, you know, he... He wrote, he wrote a, a uh, ode to an older mistress and to writing to a younger man about why older women were better, you know, eight reasons. And, and so he, he definitely fueled these. Um, there is no evidence that he was uh, unfaithful to his wife, Deborah. Um, she stayed behind in Philadelphia when he went off to London for 17 years. Um, but lack of evidence is not evidence of lack, <laughs> um, as it's been said. So we don't know for sure. And there were no paparazzi back then. By the time he got to France, he's 70 years old. Um, Deborah has passed away. Um, he's got various health, health ailments, the gout, kidney stones, but he's a huge flirt in, in France. And some historians suggest that it, it is his flirtatiousness that made him such a great diplomat for the American cause in France, that he was very good at flirting and seduction. And that's what's required of a diplomat, especially one like him who was trying to get the French government to cough up the equivalent of billions of dollars today to help the American rebels. Um, so he definitely had a flirtatious nature. Um, now, he let's talk about the, that list of 13 virtues. Um, he, so he comes up with this list and yes, chastity is on there as well as temperance and silence and, and frugality. And I would say he pretty much failed at all of them. In fact, he knows he did because he came up with this little book and a little diagram, which you can actually still buy today, uh, versions of it. And you keep track of one of these virtues per week. And anytime you stray from it, you put a little black mark. And he did that in his book, was the holes were being punched through. He called it a holy book of a different kind. Um, and he had to switch to pencil um, <clears throat> or a different kind of paper. So in other words, he, he failed at this goal of moral perfection, as he called it, but it was instructive. And he tried to be morally perfect. It sounds almost absurd today to try to achieve moral perfection. But why? I mean, we we aim for technological perfection. Why not moral perfection? <coughs> so I, I find it very inspiring that he attempted it. i tell you what I thought was interesting. That letter that he wrote, apparently it wasn't published in collections of his papers during the 19th century, but it was cited <laughs> as a reason for overturning obscenity laws and censorship in federal court rulings from the mid to the late 20th century. <coughs> so it actually did some good. <coughs> it's true. And he, he went, I was, <coughs> excuse me, an early advocate of, <coughs> See, Franklin, Franklin didn't have this problem because there was no live radio. <laughs> it was just the printed word. <coughs> No, coughing fits did not matter back in his day. <clears throat> Excuse me. He was an early advocate of free press before the First Amendment. He was early advocate of colonial unity, bringing the colonies together. And um, he was definitely ahead of his time in, uh, in a lot of ways. He was also a great wit and I think, you know, very quick on the mark with his responses. While I was reading your book, I also decided I was going to watch the Apple TV um, Franklin with Michael Douglas. And a lot of, you know, some of the quips that you mentioned in the book have been woven into that particular 
um, you know, series. And uh, last night I noticed. Well, what did you think of it? I'm curious. I like your Ben Franklin more than I like Michael <laughs> Douglas's. <laughs> I, 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 I am. Yeah, I, I, as someone who's researched Franklin, I, I think it was mostly, not completely, historically accurate. They they took some liberties, but that's to be expected. Um, I, I didn't see this, really but I thought, I thought like Douglas missed missed some of the uh, the whimsy uh, of Franklin. Yes, um, I, you know, um, I, I would have liked to have seen like someone like Gary Oldman. Um, oh, was yeah. playing Franklin. Um, yeah. I, I think he played uh, Churchill at one point. Yes. So, yes. but it, it was hard to it's hard to capture someone as as nuanced as Franklin was. So anyway, please continue. But, you know, um, one of the things I really, really loved, one of the comments, um, there was a scene where he was finally meeting um, Louis the Sixteenth, and, um, you know, after they'd definitely got themselves in a position where France wanted to back America. And um, he says something to Richard, along the, um, to uh, Louis, along the lines of... Um, let me just have a look at it. It said uh, something like, um, if all monarchies were governed by the principles in your heart, republics would never be formed. And one of his colleagues, as they're walking away, and, and of course the king loves that, and said, almost you know, says, yes, I was just saying exactly that. As he's walking away with his colleagues, the colleague says to him, well, we both lied. And he says, we lied? We merely anticipated a future truth and i thought that is absolutely classic <laughs> it is and it's clever in the in the best sense um that what he said was was not untrue he was trying to get louis to be a better version of himself yes if all monarchs covered by what's in your heart there'd be no need for a republic now franklin did leave live to see the french revolution 1789 and <clears throat> he was quite old by then but um I think it's true. I think it's it's every every lie he said was a useful lie. And I do think there's such a thing as a useful lie. And I think that was one. What, in your view, were his biggest mistakes? Oh, boy. <sighs> one on a personal level was his relationship with his, his son, William. Um, yeah. And this was, I think, by far the saddest aspect of his life. I would say chapter, but it was really several chapters. So his son, William, unlike Franklin grew up poor, William grew up with privilege. I went to law school in, in London, <coughs> was very posh, and sided with the loyalists. Excuse me. And they, they were estranged, um, and they never reconciled. And, and Franklin wrote him out of his will at the end. And uh, that was just very sad. He was very good at forgiving others. He forgave people who, who slighted him, who tricked him. He even forgave the British for fighting the war. He could not forgive his own son. He couldn't do it. And is that a mistake or a, a failing of some kind? I think that's that's definitely true. Um, he did not treat his wife as as well as he could have. Mm -hmm. um, he owned he owned enslaved people, slaves, um, seven during his life. Thomas Jefferson owned six hundred. Neither is good. Unlike Jefferson, um, Franklin really changed his mind about slavery, and I wouldn't say this is not a mistake, but this is. This is a mistake that he corrected before he died, <clears throat> which are the best kind of mistakes, actually. And so when he's an older man in the 70s and 80s, he became a, a fairly, a, a quite vocal abolitionist um, and when it was not what most people were in the American colonies at the time or the young United States by then. So he did free his slaves. He uh, wrote out against slavery. The last public piece of writing he, he published was a satirical piece about slavery, mocking the institution of slavery. So that being a slave owner was a mistake. It was a great mistake, but I find comfort and inspiration in the fact that he changed his mind 
And when he was in his 80s, I mean, most of us, as we grow older, we become more set in our ways, more mm -hmm. sure of ourselves. And he always remained flexible. At the Constitutional Convention in 1787 in, in Philadelphia, he gives this speech, this, one of the greatest speeches of all time. And he says, basically, as I get older, I begin to doubt more of my convictions. And I think we'd all be better off if we were a bit more like that. I know my country, the U.S., would be better off if people were to doubt of their own convictions a little bit more, even in, especially as they grow older. Mm. He was a very generous man. I mean, he could have made a fortune from patents, but he didn't. He gave everything away because he felt that it was important that he'd benefited from other people's inventions. Then, you know, the world should benefit from his. Right. He, he, he very much believed in the commons, something we've lost. Um, and he <clears throat> did not apply to it for any patents which existed back then, as you say. And he also lived a life of public service when he didn't have to. You know, I mean, he was not the wealthiest man back then, but he was quite upper middle class thanks to his publishing business, Poor Richard's Almanac, which he published, and, and the Pennsylvania Gazette newspaper. And he was toying with electricity, and he could have been toying with that the rest of his life, but he was called to service. And I, it sounds almost cliched and corny now to say, you know, when called to service, you have to answer, but he really did. And he, he the only thing, one thing he did fail at was retiring. He tried to retire on several occasions, and the U.S. Congress said, no, stay in France. You know, we still need you. We're not accepting your letter of resignation. So he was a... a, a huge failure as a retiree. He never really retired. Um, so he was generous uh, in, in that sense. He was generous with his time. Um, he always had time for visitors when he was old back in, in, in Philadelphia at Franklin Court. I mean, he would just talk to people for hours. Um, and Or he's living in London and some failed seamstress comes to see him, this man, and he says, oh, you know, what should I do? And he said, you know, maybe you should go to America and I'll, I'll write you a letter of recommendation. And he did. And that man's name was Thomas Paine, um, who was at the forefront of the uh, American Revolution, writing common sense. So um, he was useful that way, too. What was the most important lesson you learned about Ben and about yourself from this adventure? Oh, boy. That's a... That's a really good question. Um, uh, I'm going to cheat a little and give you two answers. One is uh, this notion of errata, which is a printing term for mistakes. And um, he thought that, you know, just like a, a book comes out, and this is maybe a shock to most readers who don't write or publish books, they almost always have a mistake in them. <clears throat> There's almost always a typo somewhere, and uh, sometimes more than one, and they're not often discovered for maybe a year later when some reader says, wait, that's the wrong, that's misspelled, there's a typo there. And publishers issue new editions um, with the errata fixed. And Franklin thought that he could do this with himself, issue new and improved editions, that when you fall short of the mark, in your relationships, in your life, it's not a sin. <clears throat> it's not a fatal mistake. It's an errata, and you can fix it. And it's a it's a kinder, gentler approach to to our mistakes. And I, I think that as I make mistakes, I now think of them as errata, and I can, I can fix it um, yeah. later on. And the other lesson is what we've been talking about, this idea of making usefulness your, your goal. And as I get older uh, and approach Franklin's age of usefulness, I think it's it's not a bad bar to, to aim for. And when we have very mixed feelings about usefulness, like people will say, oh, you know, so-and-so is just using you. You're being used, you know. I mean, that's a bad thing to be used. But why, if you think about it, you know, maybe since we only have a limited time on this earth, our goal should be to be used up, you know, like the candle that burns down to mm -hmm. the wick, you know, and down to the base. Just, so I think I've had a shift in my attitude 
where I, I want to be useful. And if people are going to use me, let them use me. That's okay. I'm willing yeah, to be useful. use you usefully. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah, so it's th those two things have have stuck with me. But there there are lots of lessons here, and um, you know his his autobiography, which he did not finish, was really the first American. You you opened with a talk about the what I call the self help industrial complex, <laughs> and and how many uh, self improvements his goal. His autobiography was really kind of the first American self help book because it was, mm -hmm. it was like here you can you can be like me right I, he wrote it you know because he wanted it to be like a, a blueprint for other young poor kids from boston or anywhere you know you can be a success in life both financially and morally if you do as i do and so yeah i have a suspicion about you having read several of your books and that is that you intentionally select your subjects based on where and how far you'll be able to travel uh oh okay don't tell anyone but it's all <laughs> well i'm a place person okay i i think when i approach a subject whether it's happiness wisdom or a, a, a benjamin franklin i don't think about what to say i think where can i go and i do that not because i love to travel because though i do love to travel it's because then i can picture them or whatever it is I'm writing about by walking in the footsteps. And I also get into a much more receptive mindset when I'm traveling. Um, and I write about this in the book. I write about how travel is uh, is very liberating in that way. It's <laughs> not what we gain, but what we lose on the road, which is we lose all our junk and stuff from back home. And so you've got, instead of a library of books, you've got maybe a dozen you've brought with you, you know, whatever it is, and you focus on those. And it, it's a way of streamlining our life. And so, yes, I traveled to, to England, to London, to France, to Boston. He did spend, Franklin spent three days on the Portuguese island of Madeira, trying to convince my wife I needed to go spend a month there investigating that, but <laughs> it did not happen. <laughs> What's... Um... So what's your next adventure? Who, who's your next subject? I don't know. Um, and, and that's an unusual position for me. Um, I, I, I want to write a, a smaller book by smaller. I don't mean shorter or thinner, but I mean something more containable um, that maybe requires a little fewer years of research. Um, and I'm knocking around a few ideas. Um, I think I may want to return to a more spiritual, directly spiritual book. Um, I'm not going to share it right now, but I'm, 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 I'll get back to you. I am okay. I am doing what a writer friend says, I'm airing out my brain. Um, and you have to do that after a book project. And it's a huge commitment, as you know. I always feel a book is like, uh, it's like a marriage. You've got to love the person in the beginning or the book idea because there are going to be rough periods ahead. And... I've yet to find the idea, the next idea that I that I love and feel passionate about, and I'm totally open. If you have any ideas, please tell me. Oh well, I did have a few while I was reading the book, but I've forgotten them. Um, okay. I'll see if they come back to me. Okay. A um, couple of personal questions. You've been described as a recovering malcontent. How is your recovery going? It's a work in progress. Um, I, um, and I don't think I'll ever be a happy, happy, smiley face person. I, I would say my attitude towards, um, my malcontentness, that's not a word, but we'll use it for now, is, uh, is like that of, um, this Icelandic musical composer named Hilmar that I met in Reykjavik. And he uh, struck me as a happy person, but his music is this very sad, haunting, melancholic music. And I said, Hilmar, what's what's the deal? You seem happy, but your music is so sad. And he said, I'll never forget this. He said, I am overall, I am a happy person, but I cherish my melancholia. And that stuck with me because I think all artists, writers, musicians, that they need that well of melancholia to dip into. But the key is you don't want it to drown you. 
you don't want the well to drown you. And, and that's the balance that I very honestly struggle with is cherishing my melancholy if I'm not having it engulf me. You know, I find it very endearing in your books where you you admit to this. You admit you know that you do have these darker moments etc and um yes, such honesty you know that it just makes us you know relate to you all the more well i think it's um we're talking about usefulness and my as i write in the book my, my mother was a school teacher my father was a, a doctor an oncologist and they were clearly useful and as a writer i sometimes question my usefulness but by opening up about something like my struggle with depression, I, I think that is useful. And that's one reason I do it. it it's when, and when a writer admits to um, struggles, flaws, they're extending a hand to the reader. And that's what I try to do with all my books and, uh, and, and in my life is to extend that hand to the reader, not to be the expert who's going to tell you how it is and I'm perfect and you're not, but to say, I'm just a slob struggling, trying to get through life like you. And here's what I found out. And maybe you can learn from it. Yeah. Well, you know, it's um, all the great comedians have that, you know, kind of melancholia. Um, and it, I think it does something and gives them a great sense of humor. And I'm not going to ask you to comment on that because we really are out of time, but, Eric Wine, I, really I really want to thank you for joining us and thank you for giving me and millions of other fans the joy of reading your books. Thank you so much, Sandy. I, I hope you have found the conversation useful. Let's put it that way. Well, I certainly did. Okay. And it's, all about me. It's, been, it's been a real pleasure. It really has. Thank you. Ben and me in search of a founder's of a founder's formula for a long and useful life is published by avid reader press love that which is an imprint of simon and schuster llc and you might want to know that eric's book the geography of bliss one grump search for the happiest places in the world is now a docu-series featuring rain wilson wilson so that brings us to the end of this week's show. If you want to know more about Eric's work, his speaking appearances, writing workshops and retreats, visit ericwinerbooks.com. That's it for this week. I'm Sandy Sedgbeer. I'll be back at the same time next week with another edition of What Is Going On. Till then, it's goodbye from me. And thank you again to Eric Weiner. <laughs>